Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. This is the day that the Lord hath made. I choose to rejoice and be glad in it. How about you? Yes. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank God for the opportunity to still make a choice. Hallelujah. Amen. To God be the glory. I welcome our uh, Facebook and YouTube and the other social media platforms with us this morning. Thank you for taking an opportunity to be with us. Whether it's morning, noon, or night, thank you for being with us because you never can tell when somebody will be watching. So we greet you in the matchless name of Jesus. There is no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, thank you. Lord, we need you. We stand in a desperate time. God, some of us are not even aware of the hour and the moment that we as a people are in. But Lord, you know. You know the end from the beginning. Father, give us ears to hear today. Give us a heart to obey today. And may the word of God make us uncomfortable. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And amen. amen. Well, said, Pastor, why are you preaching and make, pray that it make us uncomfortable? Because the problem is we're too comfortable. I was reading an article, and they were talking about the, um, and I, I was thinking about this earlier and just happened to flip and seen the article. I said, um, I was thinking about us from a military standpoint. I said, there's a reason the military doesn't train at home. I mean, you wouldn't want the Green Berets to stand at home training. It's too comfortable. You need to get in the mud. You need to get in the dirt. You need to get, get, get in the cold climates. You need, because that's where the wars are fought at. And the article was talking about 70% of our youth today are not ready for military. They couldn't serve because of crime, drugs, or obesity. We are living under a misrepresentation that we're ready for war. Most of us remember hearing that America had one of the greatest war machines ever created. That was then. That's not now. Our readiness is nowhere near. And I'm not, that ain't what I'm talking about this morning. But I want to share with you on Friday, I'm doing a shut-in. Anybody that want to come, you could come. If you don't want to come, don't have to. But Friday, I'm doing a shut-in. We're going to fast at 12 o'clock. If you want to come, I need you to fast to 12. If you don't, you don't have to fast. You don't have to do anything. But I'm going to share some stuff that night. Because I believe it's time for us to understand what time it is and make a decision on what we want to do. You will not know on my watch. You may not know, but it's because you chose not to. You've done everything in your power to avoid knowing what time it is. So that's Friday. You're welcome to attend. All I'm asking is that you fast because I'm going to share some stuff. You can bring your kids. I ain't telling you lead them home. No, bring them. Bring them. Bring your babies. Maybe they're going to catch it even if we don't. It is a critical time, you all. I stood here on last Sunday and told you about the urgency of getting food. Tuesday, they invade Ukraine. The individuals in Ukraine were saying on Monday, it was a normal day. Kids went to school. We were doing the normal things. And lo and behold, this is the way it's going to happen. It's going to be sudden. And people are going to be caught off guard because they're thinking the things that they're doing right now are important. Hey, man. Um, that wasn't my intro into what I'm going to do today. <laughs> But nevertheless, I am inviting you to come and share with us on this Friday. Um, I guess we'll meet at 7. Uh, we'll make sure that the doors are open. We're going to come. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're, I'm going to share some things with you that I don't have the liberty to share right now. So we'll go from there. Amen. This morning, I want to talk to you uh, on a topic 
that some of us will think is negative when I share it, but I hope you see its implications to all of our lives as you listen to the rest of this. And if truth be told, there will be some parts that you're probably uncomfortable with, but that's good. You know, someone said that pain to the nervous system lets you know you're alive. <laughs> you, know, I, you know, I don't want to be in pain. Well, you know, if you didn't, you know, if you didn't stub your toe, what's to stop you from something cutting it off and you not even realize it? My subject this morning is the sifting has begun. The sifting has begun. When I was a little child, young boy, I remember my, my and I, if I'm not mistaken, it was my grandmother and she would make biscuits. And it was something about seeing, back then, flour didn't come the way flour comes now. I had the opportunity of growing up with my grandparents early in life and I saw a lot, of old, a lot of old ways that things were done. And they would, uh, well, my grandmother, when she would make the biscuits, I remember being, seeing the table there, but it was, what was intriguing to me wasn't the making of the biscuits. It was a, a contraption that she had that was part of the process. Oh, some of y'all know where I'm going. See, it wasn't just the flour and the oil and the butter and all. It was when she would start, it was this one contraption that intrigued me more than anything. I find, I, I find myself playing with it because it was just so intriguing. And, oh, see, see y'all, 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 I got y'all already. I got y'all already. It, it was a little thing that you could hold in your hand and you, you would begin to crank it a little bit. I know some of them you squeeze, but the one she had, you cranked it. And while you were cranking it, the flour would begin to fall out. But it wasn't just the same. See, it wasn't the same flour that went in. In this sense, this flour would come out and it would be light and fluffy. It, it was almost powdery when it would fall down. And you see, see, the powder would begin to get on everything. And because it would come through this little, little, little contraption that you can kind of st- you turn it, and it was like moving on the inside of that. What it was was an agitator. It was agitating the flour so it could get the lumps out of it. And in the course of you cranking it, you begin the agitation process, and the light flour will begin to fall out. And that's what she would use to make them biscuits. Boy, oh boy. But it took something like that. And I was just so intrigued about that contraption. It was called a sieve. Because that's what would sift the flour. This morning, I want to talk to you on the subject, the sifting has begun. In Amos chapter 9, verse 9, the Bible says, For lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations. Like as corn is sifted in a sieve. Yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. Most people panic when you talk about sifting. Because we come to Luke chapter 22, which is where I want to go today. It's going to be the text that we're going to go from. Luke chapter 22, verse 31 to be in particular. Most people panic because this is the scripture that they think of when you talk about sifting. And it is actually the the scripture I want to use but I want to use it in its correct context because oftentimes we have been misinformed and therefore we become afraid when we talk about sifting. The Bible says, Luke chapter 22, verse 31, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you. If you read the original text, it lends that it is not just Peter that the enemy desires to have. It's all the disciples. Sifting is a process for everybody. If 
we want to be honest, the church has been going through sifting since its inception. The Bible says there's wheat and tares. There's sheep and goats. The Bible says that there are some who have crept in unawares. No matter what kind of religious pretenses you can set up, no matter what kind of laws and regulations you put in place, there's always going to be some people who get in unawares. It's going to always need to be a sifting in the church. It's, 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 uh, it was amazing. I watched Deacon Green several weeks ago when we had our poinsettias out. And Deacon Green walked around unnoticed by most people and began to pluck from the flowers the dead things that was on them. Pull off little pieces here and there. Nobody was crying out saying how terrible that is to do that to that flower. Because anybody that understands anything from horticulture knows that it's necessary to get the dead things out so it can grow correctly. But when we talk about sifting in the church, people panic. When we talk about sifting in our personal lives, we get afraid. When we look at sifting, then it must mean that, oh, my goodness, something's going to happen to me. Why, don't we, why are we panicking when we realize it's a process that's always been going on? It's a process that's necessary. Let's talk about sifting a little bit. First off, let's get a workable definition. Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. He wants to sift you the same way you sift wheat. Wait a minute. Sifting wheat is a good thing. Oh, my goodness. Okay, I, I got to make sure I got you. So sift. What does sift mean? What is this process? We're using uh, terminology that most of us are no longer familiar with because we've become, after all, so technologically advanced. We've moved on from having to sift our flour now. It's sifted before we get it. <laughs> unless we want to, you know, unless those of us who do uh, baking to a, maybe a higher degree want to do our confectionery sugars and all of these kinds of things. Uh, you know, but most of us, uh, you know, it's, it's all good. We don't need that now. So we have to go back and learn what did Jesus mean? What was he actually saying to us, Minister Plummer, when he said the enemy wants to sift you as you sift wheat? So what was he saying to us? Well, when we understand that the word sift actually means Listen to this. It's an inward agitation. I want to make sure you understand. It's on the inside. It's an inward agitation. The, the sieve that my grandmother used to have, see, it wasn't an agitation on the, sugar, on the flour on the outside. It was what was happening on the inside of the sieve. When you, crank, when you begin to crank it a little, it was the agitator that was cranking on the inside. You couldn't see what was happening on the inside of that. You just knew when it was coming out, it was a different consistency than when it went in. Oh, I'm preaching it better than you saying amen already. You'll catch up and get it, I promise you. Sift, it's an inward agitation. See, when Jesus is talking about this, I want you to understand what he's saying. It's an inward agitation to try one's faith. Oh yeah, uh-huh. This is an inward agitation to try one's faith to the verge of overthrow. Oh, yeah. Well, Pastor, how can this possibly be good? You said it's an inward agitation to try my faith to the verge of overthrowing it. Yes. Yes. Do you know if you've ever been to the gym and really worked out? See, we have a, you, you say you in shape. You know how you find out how strong you are? How much weight can you bear? How far can you really run? See, you don't know this until there's a test, until you come to the verge of overthrow, until you come to the point of that's as much as I could possibly bear. Help me get it off. Now I know how strong I am. Oh, I am preaching better than you saying amen. I understand. It was an ouch moment for me too. 
So it's an inward agitation to try one's faith to the verge of overthrow. But Webster also lends us a definition that we need to remember as well. To sift means to go through, especially to sort out what is useful or valuable. It's to go through to sort out. You're going through to sort out what's useful or valuable. If I ain't preaching to nobody else today, I am preaching to myself because I said, Lord, I want it. I want every bit of it. I want to learn. I want. What are you saying, God? The time is late. It is later than you think. Before I even start, there are some things that I have recognized in my own life that needs to be sifted. Some things that I've said, God, I don't like about me. Things that I, I'm, can I be honest with you? Things that you try to smooth over, but the lump is still there. Things that you try to suppress, but still needs to be removed. See, I figure if I let you know that I am first looking at me, not you. Then you won't pre You don't feel like I'm preaching to you or at you, but I'm preaching for us. Amen. So since we know it's an inward agitation to try our faith to the verge of overthrow, since we know it's to go through, especially, especially to sort out what is useful and valuable. Let's talk about understanding the purpose of sifting. Luke chapter 22, verse 31. Let's take off from there. But we're going to understand, number one, the purpose of the sifting. Why is this happening? You say, Pastor, the sifting has begun. Why is this happening? Let's understand the purpose. The Bible says in Luke 22 and 31, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Before we understand the purpose, I want to share this with you. Who God allows to do the sifting is not as important as the sifting itself. Amen. The reason most people get the connotation of this scripture wrong or the context of this scripture wrong is because Satan is the one who is desiring to sift Peter. Most Christians freak out simply because of that. And they automatically assume that sifting is a bad process. They automatically assume that this is something you never want to happen to you. They automatically assume, oh my goodness, Satan, who God uses to sift you does not matter. It is the sifting that's important. Amen. So he says, and, Lord, he's, and, he, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. See, the devil is still God's devil, meaning he can use him to accomplish his will in the earth. We seem to have forgotten that we're talking about God. We seem to have forgotten who we're really talking about when we simply say, look at what he's saying. Satan has desired to sift you. But God created Satan. See, we, we want to lend all of this power and ability to the devil as though he's someone uh, all powerful and all. That. He's not. This is still God's devil. And God can use him to accomplish his will in the earth. Now, since we're understanding the purpose of the sifting. Let me share with you a little insight. The adversary's goal in this process of sifting is to provide an inward agitation to try our faith to the verge of overthrow. Okay. Mm -hmm. He, in essence, becomes the inward agitation. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. His goal is to see, see your faith and my faith come to the verge of overthrow. Well, what do you mean, Pastor? His goal is to make us want to quit. Mm -hmm. yes, 
His goal is to make us want to throw in the towel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. His goal is to make us want to concede to his lies. That's his goal in the process. After all, he is the inward agitation. His goal is to beat us into submission. His goal, see, no, 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 no. He, 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 his goal is to bring us to the point where we want to simply throw in the towel. Let me help you for a minute because I feel like some of you all are standing on a religious horse and I need to assist you. I need to assist you like the Apostle Paul when he was riding en route to Damascus. And he was thrown from his horse. I need to assist you this morning because the religious horse is not going to be able to stand in a moment. Because here's the difference. We, every one of us, have moments in our life where we wonder about our faith. Where we wonder, is God going to do what he said he's going to do? When we get in situations and circumstances, we begin to go like, Lord, I know what you said. But God, look what I'm dealing with. Things don't look like what your word says. And there are moments where it's like, God, what are you going to do? I'm still stuck here dealing with this situation. I confess what you said. I'm standing on it. But it don't look right. God, it don't feel right. So now what do you believe? No, 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 no. Not what you say. What you believe. What you really believe. See, now a little weight is on the bar. How strong are you really? Yeah, you, 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 you said you benched 350. But now we got the bar and the weight. Let's see if what you said line up with what you can do. I love God with all my heart. That's what you said. But now we got the bar. Lord, I go through anything for you. Now we got the bar and the weight. Are you feeling me now? I just want you to come down off the horse so we be eye level. So his goal, I want to make sure we define, that's his goal. He's the inward agitation to try our faith to the verge of overthrow. That's his goal. Make us want to quit. Make us want to throw in the towel, to concede to his lies. But that's not the same goal that your heavenly father has in the sifting process. Amen. He's still going to use the agitation, but it ain't the same goal. When my, when my grandmother was putting the flour in, in, in the sieve, she wasn't doing the, to, to, to throw the flour away. She wasn't, watch this, she wasn't doing it because she didn't like the flour. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Took you a little moment there. Uh-huh. It took you a little while to get there. She wasn't agitating the flower because she didn't like it. It was to get the lumps out. See, God's goal is not the same as what the enemies is. Let me help you. Job chapter 23, verse 10. Bible says, but he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. See, the refining process, that, I mean, the process that God is doing in the midst of this, this sifting is designed to refine our souls. See, you have to, you see, see, I'm going to tell you something. You're going to always have to step back and say, listen, God is good. No, 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 no. We say that when he do something we like. You, you, listen, listen to the saints that we're around. They say that when he do something he, they like. But if you can come to the understanding, the realization that God is good, then you'll understand anything he does, anything he allows. Because he's good. Not just because I like it. Because there's some good stuff God does that I don't like. Amen. Oh, no, no, no. There's some good stuff God does to you that you don't like. Yes, 
Don't worry, the sifting has begun. It's too late now. You, you can't run, you can't hide. The sifting has begun. It's a refiner of our soul. Psalms 26 and 2. The Bible says, in Psalms 26 and 2, examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. See, we get the physical examination. When, when do we do the spiritual one? Sometimes you got to show up and get the spiritual examination. Try, me, try my heart and my, the reins and my heart. Try the inward stuff the folks can't see. Remember the sieve. It is it's on the inside the agitation is taking place. You can't see what's going on in there. It's the inward examination. What's the things in your heart? What's the things that have gotten in there over the course of the years that have built up? The things that you look at and you say, man, I don't like me being like that. You don't want nobody else to see it, but you know it's there. I don't believe like I used to. I don't hold on like I used to. I don't confess stuff like I used to. Oh, yeah, yeah, you don't say that because people say, well, how you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored. But on the inside, you know. And then what about the parts that we not even real with ourselves? Well, you see something in you, but then you say something like, well, it's all right. God understands. After all, you know, I ain't, I ain't there yet. God's still working on me. How we excuse behavior that's not Christ-like. You, you know, I'm talking about the things that, that, that we really don't want to deal with, Minister Plum. Don't really want to see the real me in the mirror. And then when I see it, I just, ah. Oh. Just, you know, just cover up that piece a little bit more so people won't see that. Don't want to really deal with it, just want to cover it up. Amen. But see, he says, listen, examine me, oh Lord. No, this examination, you see, see, the doctor ain't trying to hide stuff. Right. Doctor trying to find whatever's there. Yes. Because he has your best interests yes. at heart. Amen. It's my job to find the problem. Amen. I just needed you to show up. Examine me, O oh Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. God, help me to be, help me to do what I say. Can we just stay there just for a moment? Help me to do what I say. Is your word still good? No, no, your word. Do you do what you say? And do you say what you do? God does. And after all, we're supposed to be imitators of God. Yeah. Parents, our children let us know. We don't do what we say. So we tell them, do what I say, not what I do. See, it's the in internal examination. See, we're talking about what's God's goal out of this? What is God getting from this sifting process. So we, as we're understanding the purpose of sifting, Zechariah 13, 9. Zechariah 13 and 9. The Bible says, and I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. See, it refines our understanding of who God is. In my life, and I believe yours, you have learned more about God when you went through some stuff than you did when you were on the mountaintop. 
the process where things were being stripped and removed from us. And this ain't always stuff. There's sometimes that God does an inner work, that he's removing things. But one of the, one of the unique things is this seems to always happen or seems to be uh, a process that happens when you are alone. It seems to happen when there's, and when I say alone, it's not that you can't have other people in the room. God can do it and everybody be around you. But it's something about the level of support. The people are in the room, but they don't even know what's happening with you. Something is going on. The agitation process is happening with you all around you. Things are moving and shaking and being stripped and pulled. And pull. Everybody like, hey, how you doing? And you almost going like, don't you see all of this happening to me? Don't you know? But no, they don't see. Because remember, it's an inward agitation. How you wake up and you feel kind of like, I mean, you just get up and like, man, I mean, you, it's like you almost on the edge with everybody already. And you saying, God, what's wrong with me? I'm working on you. I'm doing a work. Yeah, this is an inward job. And yeah, you're still able to say the right things. You're still like, mm, yeah, enough to get you by. Because there's work that's happening. I tell you what. Well, I, let me stay right here. Revelation chapter 3, verse 19. New Living Translation. Revelation 3 and 19. We're still talking about understanding the purpose of sifting. See, God's purpose is different than what the enemy's is. The enemy always think he's winning with some stuff. Some, some, but it, uh, you imagine, this, he has been used for all, all of this time, and he still think he's winning. <laughs> Everything. That's just, see, it, I, it's not so much as his ignorance as it is God's wisdom. The Bible says, I correct and discipline everyone I love. You want God to love you? Expect correction and discipline. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. There's a time that we become indifferent in the ways of, of our life. I don't care. I don't care. You're just indifferent to the world. So maybe you need a little correction. Maybe you need a little discipline. I don't care what they say. Yeah, you just need some correction. You need some uh, discipline now. Well, well, Pastor, we ain't supposed to care what everybody's saying, what everybody do. No, no, that ain't what I'm saying. Sometimes we, we can become so to the point where we think because we got everything we seemingly want or need that we don't need nobody, including God. Oh, you got a good job now. But let me, let, me, let me refresh your memory. What was it like when you were believing God to get that job? What was your disposition then? How did you look then? How humble were you then? Now you got a couple promotions under your belt for calling your name. You got a little parking spot. Oh, yeah, come on. See, now we're indifferent. But a little correction and discipline can fix that. And I'm going to do it because I love you. Because I could let you keep going in that mess. And you'll find yourself in a hot place for a long time. Oh, I'm preaching better than you saying amen. It's all right. It's all right. So he says, I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. See, all of God's correction and discipline is out of his love for us. Listen to this. C.H. Spurgeon said this. Purification will be the result of agitation. Purification 
will be the result of agitation. Look, agitation in your life is going to bring some purification in your life. That flower that come through the sifter after it's been agitated, light, fluffy, for it within, clumpy, nothing that you want to try to bake with. Instead of biscuits, you have rocks. But that light, fl- that light flower coming out, ooh, all over the, all over the floor. You got to sweep afterwards, cause it's not light and powdery, cause it was agitated. Boy, y'all looking at biscuits now. Come on back in here. Come on back. All of y'all, come back. Ain't no biscuits this morning. If you ain't had them already, you have to get them later. Come on. We talking about sifting. Hallelujah. So not only do we un- understand the purpose of the sifting, but we need to understand the process of sifting. Remember, I gave you two definitions. It wasn't just the agitation, the inward agitation, that's the trying our faith to the verge of overthrow, but it also has to do with us passing through something. It's sorting out what's useful and valuable. Are you ready? Psalms chapter 1, verse 4. I want to show you something. Oh, Holy Ghost. Mm-mm-mm. Psalms chapter 1, verse 4. The Bible says, The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Listen to me now. The chaff is the outward husk that covers the grain, it's the outward husk that covers the grain. It's the outward husk that covers the grain. It's the outward husk that covers the grain. Well, Pastor, why do you keep saying that? So you'll get it. So you'll get it. Listen to this. John 3 and 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Most of our problem is flesh. It's the outward husk that covers the grain. Most of our problem is with the outward husk that covers the grain. So you have to take the chaff and beat it. So you can separate it from the grain. Most of our problem is with the outward husk that needs to be beat into submission. I'm preaching better than you said amen for sure. Now, pastor, you talking about my flesh, talking about, I ain't talking about just yours, I'm talking about ours. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. This stuff need to perish. All that good smelling Flesh, all that nicely dressed up flesh, it's perishing every day. So our inward man, it's the inward man that we got to work on. And most of us are just dressing up our flesh. You got nasty attitudes, dressed up flesh. Don't want to treat people right, dressed up flesh. Let me ask you something. If you were the only Christian on earth, what kind of witness would Jesus have? No, no, no. Don't say what you want to say. Say what's real. Only living Christian on earth, on the planet, and you get to represent the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. What kind of representative would he have? Bunch of dressed up flesh. The sifting has begun. (laughs) 
Watch this. He says, but I like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Not only is the chaff the outward husk that covers the grain, the chaff is what is separated during the threshing or the beating of the grain. It's what's separated when either, see, let, let me help you. You remember Gideon, the Bible says he was threshing wheat at the wine press. First off, at the wine press, you should be pressing wine. But if you understand the text, he's hiding from the Midianites. So the wine press, wine press is more like a trough. The threshing floor was actually at the highest point on a hilltop or a mountain or something because it was necessary for the wind to blow. So when you understand that he's in a trough threshing wheat, you know it's the wrong place to be doing what he's doing until you understand he's doing it because he's hiding. So what he's doing, he's beating it. It's like taking a stick and taking a piece of a plant or something and just beating it until it begins to separate. It took this kind of beating to separate the husk from the grain. It was the chaff which the wind driveth away. Watch this, watch this. I want to make sure you're getting this. Philippians chapter 3, verse 3. So there's separation that's taking place. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. There needs to be a separation when we no longer. Right, let, let me ask you something. Honestly, is your confidence in God or your flesh? See, I love to think about things that we used to couldn't do. Because when we couldn't do them, we realized how dependent we were. But what happens when we learn a little something? Remember, just, let's, let's, let's go back to that nice job you have. What about when you didn't know how to do it? Oh, God, I really ain't qualified for this, Lord. I don't know how, Lord. I don't, know I don't want the people. Oh, Lord. Oh. See, you were dependent. Do you realize how many times we walk in now not even praying about what we do? You know why? Confidence in our flesh. I got this, God. Thank you. Appreciate it. I got it. But look what the scripture says. And have no confidence in the flesh. I just want you to understand why we, why we need sifting. See, because we're so confident, we don't even think we need sifting. Lord, I, I'm good now. How about raising kids? Parents? Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Remember when you believe in God for a baby. Lord, help me. Lord, we, oh God, we just need you. Lord, we're we going to just touch and agree now for this baby. Oh God, please, please, Lord. And now, get up and go to school, all of y'all. Get out of here. Oh yeah. All of y'all. What do you mean the bus ain't here yet? Well, none of y'all coming back home early. It ain't no school today. Y'all going somewhere. <laughs> Same ones we believe God for. <laughs> see, I'm just saying, see how these things change over the course of time? And we don't understand that there's lumps in the flower. It's still flour, but it's lumps. It needs to be sifted. needs to be sifted. Some stuff in there that don't need to be in there no more. Amen. It's like the chaff yeah. which the wind driveth away. It needs to be separated. Y'all yeah. still with me? Yeah. Let me show y'all that we ain't the only ones. You remember when Jesus said, Simon, Simon, 
Satan hath desired to have you so he may sift you as wheat. Well, now, you, you, you are very familiar how the story goes on, but let me show you some behind-the-scene aspects. Let me show you some things that were happening during the same time. Let me show you the attitude of a Peter and us that's unbeknownst to us. Go with me to Matthew chapter 26, which is a rendition of the same story as we find in Luke chapter 22 and verse 31. So Luke 22 and 31, we see that. So this is when Peter tells him, I mean, when Jesus tells him Satan desired to have not just Peter, remember, but all of them. So go to Matthew chapter 26. I'm sorry, let me make sure I get the right one. Matthew 26 and 33. Matthew 26 and 33. Rendition of the same story. Okay. Peter answered and said unto him, though all men shall be offended because of thee. Yet will I never be offended. <laughs> Jesus, I am always here with you. I don't know what the mother brother's going to do, but I am here. You can always count on me. You know, let me, let me read this to you like I got it. Personal comfort can breed false confidence. Personal comfort can breed false confidence confidence what do you mean pastor when Peter is saying this ain't no trouble I mean everything good you with Jesus I mean what's better than that you with him y'all walking together you don't see him raise the dead casting out devils I mean miracles Lord listen if, all, if everybody else leave I am here but that's the personal comfort that's breeding false confidence. Amen. Amen. So, Lord, what's, what's, what's in my life because of my personal comfort? Let me help you a little bit again. See if I can maybe find you. Every one of us in here have struggled somewhere. Struggled getting to where you are now. Some, maybe it was your home Maybe it was your job. Maybe it was your car. Man, there was something that was a struggle. There was somewhere where you, you, you had to believe. You didn't see it. You had to believe it. You had to hope for it. Oh, you, one, oh God. One, oh, Lord, I'm believing you. You had to believe for that. But now you're in your personal comfort. What you believing for now? This personal, is, is it, can you really say the same things you used to say? What, what, what's, what's, <laughs> Perry, what's it like being retired? You ain't got to go to work no more. You ain't got to get up, check, gonna keep coming. What if it's changed the dynamics now? Of who you see God as? See, personal comfort can breed false confidence. Because all of a sudden we think we are right. Peter like, yeah, I, I don't care if everybody else is offended, Jesus. I'm here with you. You count on me. We all know what happened. I just want us to see that Peter ain't the only one. Because we find ourselves with that personal comfort. Mm, Stuff looking good, got a house. You, you remember when you first got the house and you was like, God, can I make the payment? Am I even going to be able to make the payment? Amen. I was talking to my, my, my parents uh, years ago now and they told me, not, not, just relax, just relax. <laughs> they told me what their house payment was. It used to be $99 a month. But it wasn't always easy for them at $99 a month. But that was the day when you got yours. And you was like, Lord, just help me to make it. God, just help me to make this payment. 
help me to make the payment. Now all of a sudden we pass making payments. You got a little bit of little stuff left over, feeling a little good. And we can say stuff, but we don't really know if we mean it yet. Because right now we're saying it out of personal comfort, which is breeding false confidence. Just, just, just stick with me for a second. We, 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 we're not going to leave you there. That ain't what God wants. But see, we, we're understanding the process now. We, we, we understand the purpose. Now we understand the process. What's happening? How's this? What, what's going on? Luke chapter 22, verse 33 and 34, following up from Luke, the earlier portion. Verse 33 says this, And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. This is Peter talking again. <laughs> Open mouth, insert foot. <laughs> oh, no, no, that's some of us. We, we big time with God. Oh, yeah, we, we God's man and woman of faith and power. Full of all kind of professions. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Let, let me give you the, 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 the new buzzword, decrees. We're going to decree stuff. Oh, we're going to find a new word. First, you, you know, in the 70s and 80s, we used to be claim, naming it and claiming it. Now we're decreeing it. I just, you know, and I, I mean, and these things have their place. But where's the life behind it? We named it, claimed it, and tried to frame it. But then you know what? If there wasn't no life behind it, we're decreeing and declaring it and still ain't got it. Where's the life behind it? Look what Peter said. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. God, for God I live, for God I die. At one time you meant that. Do you mean it now? With your personal comfort. I was watching something interesting, you know, in Ukraine. It was interesting that people went to the gun store and bought weapons to defend their country. Everyday civilians. Now, don't, don't, get, don't get it twisted. I'm just simply saying that was interesting. That instead of running like the rest of the 150,000 people who are running from their country, and you could say, well, Pastor, I'll be running too. These people said, you know what? I'm going to defend what I believe in. They were saying, I'm ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. One day they're at school. The next day they have a rifle in their hand. When you're sitting there watching it, there's a young man who says, I've only fired 14 rounds in my entire life. What do you really believe? Will you run or will you stand your ground? That's why we have to be sifted. That's why we have to be sifted. Because we can say something right now because it's personal comfort. Watch this. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. Verse uh, 34, and he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. It's easy to be like Peter was, overconfident in our flesh until we face the real challenges of life. Life has challenges. There's ugly things that happen in life. Life has challenges. It's going to come. Amen. It's easy to say that you believe that God is a healer until you sick. Amen. It's easy to say that, say that God is your, he's a provider. Won't you just believe God till you lose your job? Amen. There's a reason for the sifting. John 13 and 37. Hope you don't mind we take a little time today. John 13 and 37, the Bible says, Peter said unto him, Lord, 
Why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Let me just be very straight to the point. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, we are all weak and self-centered despite our own misguided perception of ourselves. Without the power of the Holy Spirit. Understand, Peter is saying this apart from the Holy Ghost. This is Peter running his mouth. Listen, don't hate on the brother now. Don't hate on him. So I'll lay down my life for your sake. See, without the power of the Holy Spirit, we just run in our mouth. That's why we can't boast ourselves of tom what tomorrow holds. So I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Lord, save me now. Save me now. Don't know what I might say tomorrow. Don't know what I might do tomorrow. Lord, save me now. You sit up and say, I don't tell lies. You lying now. See, it, you, you know, we get in situations and circumstances, all of us, mm, well, uh, uh. Just be honest. Lord, I'm but flesh. And except for your spirit residing on the inside of me, I'm self-centered. I'm subject to doing anything, saying anything. I need just, see, where's that dependence at again? Well, you understand no good thing dwells in our flesh. But because ours is clean and smell a little, it's cleaned up a little bit and it smell a little better than it used to, we, well, it ain't that bad, you know, after all. Good word. Amen. Good word. See, I want you to understand what was happening with Peter is happening often with all of us. Yes. All of a sudden, you know, we, get, we got time for every, everything else other than God. It's easy to find ourselves entertained. easy to find ourselves occupied by other things than God. But I want to remind you of something. I want to see if you got any lumps in your flower here. When you first started, your hunger for God encompassed everything. Everything. Mama, I, I, I need to go spend some time in prayer now. I'll be back. It was a lifestyle you lived. What, it wasn't praying about something. It was being with God. Where you at now? God ain't changed. Woo. That was a shot across the bow, wasn't it? I mean, I see, see, cause we can think the reason I'm doing this is not to make you per se uncomfortable, although that is part of it. But for us to realize why we need to be sifted. Because we can have the tendency because of our misguided perception of ourselves to think that we are right. To think that we're not so self-centered, although we are. So we need the power of the Holy Spirit. We're dependent upon him. Amen. Holy Spirit, I need you. Yes. See, the chaff is what separated during the beating. It's the thing that separated from the grain when you're threshing it. When you throw the grain up in the air after it's been beat, it's the chaff that's going to blow away and the grain going to fall back to the ground. Let me, let, let me deal with this last part of the chaff and we'll move on. The Bible says in Psalms 1 and 4, but the, it talks about the chaff is like the wind. I mean, it's, 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 the chaff is, is there so the wind could literally just blow the chaff, chaff away. It's inferring something about the chaff. 
is light. No substance. No real weight. The chaff has no real weight apart from the grain, so the wind easily blows it away. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. Ooh, my goodness, this is about to be, mm, mm, mm. that's good to me. The Bible says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. An eternal weight of glory. So the chaff has no real weight. But the sifting helps separate the weightier matters. Glennette, put that in the New Living Translation, please. Watch this. You thought I was just talking. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs. Look at this. The glory has weight. The chaff has no weight. So the wind blows it away. The wind doesn't blow glory away. It blows chaff away. That's why it needs to be separated. So we're understanding the purpose of the sifting. We're understanding the process of the sifting. I want to talk about, as we close with this, understanding the value of what is useful. I'm sorry, understanding what is useful and valuable after the sifting. So, Pastor, I understand now purpose of the sifting, understand kind of the process of the sifting. What's going to come out of this? I mean, ain't that really what we want to know? I, I mean, there's some things where if you just know God getting something out of this is worth going through it. I mean, amen? I mean, some things you're like, well, Lord, I don't understand. You know, I remember we was going through so bad one time. I remember my wife said, God, if you get glory out of this, then so be it. I was feeling the same. So, I mean, I just, you know. Because, because what you're saying is I ain't getting nothing out of it. I mean, in the sense of I'm not getting no glory out of it. It ain't feeling good to me. I'm not enjoying this. But, Lord, if you, if you're deriving any glory from this, then so be it. We used to be like that. We used to say stuff like that and mean it. So understanding what is useful and valuable after the sifting. I'd like to go back to Luke chapter 22 and verse 32 this time. So after Jesus has told him in verse 31, Simon, Simon, listen, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. So now Jesus comes with a response. He continues his dialogue, if you will, with Peter. Jesus says, but it supersedes what Satan wants to do. Supersedes how you may feel about the process. Supersedes what you think, your opinion. Notice God didn't invite Peter to have a discussion about the sifting process. Well, I, I, Lord, I got something to do tomorrow, so can we work, start sifting next week? Just, just want to make sure we all are aware. Jesus says, but I have prayed for thee. Woo, wait a minute. Jesus prayed for him. Oh, my goodness. Come on now. Come on. Jesus praying for you. So he got to be praying that you don't be sifted, right? Come on, y'all. Read the book. Where y'all at? Oh, my goodness. Come on now. Where y'all at? What book you reading? What book you read? But I have prayed for thee. What did I pray? That your faith fail not. Jesus didn't pray to prevent him from being sifted. If we would have prayed, we'd have said, Lord, don't let it happen. 
Oh, it ain't the will of God that the enemy be able to sift me like wheat. Oh, it ain't. But nevertheless, Jesus prayed. And he said, I want your faith to fail. And about how you feel. It's about your faith, not failing. I'm going to let this process run its course. I'm going to let it transpire in your life. Because I love you. Come on, Minister Plumber, I'm preaching better than you saying amen. I'm going to let it happen. But I don't want your faith to fail. I'm going to let it transpire in your life. You're going to hurt. You're going to want to give up. You're going to want to throw in the towel. But you know what? Your faith ain't going to fail. See, I want to understand what's useful and valuable. Jesus didn't pray to prevent the sifting. Jesus prayed to prevent the failing of his faith. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. What is useful and valuable after this sifting process? Help me to understand that, Lord. He says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. There was a time where you believed in the power of God. You walked believing the power of God. You believed that nothing was impossible. You believed that. But what about now? What about now? What about when situations come up on your job and you see a system a system that has kept people oppressed. Can you see a God who can actually move a system on your behalf? There was a time when nothing was impossible. What do you see now? That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men and their system. The things, the networks that they've created. I believe that we're about to see systems and networks that men have created collapse. One of the reasons is God is showing who's on the throne. But also, there are some people who are depending on systems. There are some systems that people have made idols of. They found themselves worshiping idols, the systems that men have created. And God said, I have no other gods before me. There's an establishment going on here. It's going to make sure our faith is not resting in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Drawing us back to believe in God can do anything but fail. Back to the place where we would say stuff, looking at our own kids and say, but God. But now we let them go. Times when we would tell our children, no, baby, I know God will. I know what he can do. Now, we, how, are we even conveying the truths of the gospel now, even to our children? I'm not talking about a bunch of, oh, well, you know, we see, I, there's some parts of testimonies I hate. I really do. I'm going to be honest with you. Because we dress it up too much. We make it look like, oh, well, oh, why don't you say I didn't believe nothing and God came through? Because we didn't. We, we, by the time we finished, people are like, what? Or it ain't like, man, now, now God, that was awesome because we saw God. We see so much people in stuff. And I'm not just talking about in general here, you all don't, don't. Don't shut all down. I'm talking about when we hear people testify and it's so long and it's so drawn out and you go like. But the reality is, you know what? I didn't think God was going to come through. I thought I, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. And God showed up and he made a way. It's kind of like if we was describing the Red Sea and him opening it up, it had been like 15, 20 pages. But he says, Moses, Stretch out your rod. Bam. And it's done. 
So we left. See, notice when you finish the story of the Red Sea, you see nothing but God. If we'd have done it, you'd have been like, man, you couldn't believe how I was holding that water back on both sides. And then... <laughs> said, Lord, uh-uh. Y'all, let me stay here. Let me, let me stay here. See, I, our faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. I said, Lord, help me. Because I've seen so much stuff. I've learned so much. See, you, you cannot unknow what you know. With knowledge cometh sorrow. That's what the scripture says. Here's what it's saying. See, when you start to learn stuff, now you know things. Okay, and if... Oh, let, let me help you. Okay, COVID came. Changed the world as people know it. And I, listen, let, let me, I want to make sure I am absolutely above board with you on what I am saying. So if you misinterpret this, you can see me later. <laughs> I am for vaccination. I don't have a problem with getting vaccinated. I got all mine. Okay. Here's what's intriguing to me. With a vaccine or without a vaccine. God is still the healer. One of the greatest divides I saw in the church is this thing where people were like, if you do get vaccinated, you don't have faith. And if you don't get vaccinated, you do have faith. And I'm like, who gave that definition? Where in the world did that come from? That has no be so if you get contract whatever disease and go to the doctor, you don't have faith. Where is this garbage coming from? We're running a, a unit right now in our church in three minutes. It kills COVID in the air. So does that mean we don't have faith? Or does that mean we have enough wisdom to go out and buy what we need? Amen. Faith without works is dead being alone. That's what my Bible says. So we put some works to our faith. Now we made our church one of the safest places you could possibly be. More safer than Walmart when you out there. More safer than the restaurant when you out there. And you in, the, you in the restaurant with your mask off. You in here with your mask on because you want to. But we got something to, well, I'm just saying. And people are like, well, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to go to church and be around all of those people. Stay away from the bank, too. Well, I go to the drive too, Pastor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have them deliver my food. You know, people, people can make all of these kinds of, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. But all I'm simply saying, it was the same God. Here, here, here's the real crazy thing. Before they told us to wear masks, who was keeping us then? Think about this. Do you think that the disease just stopped, I mean, the virus stopped the day you put on the mask? Okay, we got it now. God was still God before you put on the mask. Before they had a cure, God was still God. With the new BA2 variant that is more severe in symptoms than Omicron is, God is still God. And if you didn't know, yes, there's another variant currently out but the same God is on the throne. See, I, I, I don't get it twisted, you all. I don't want my faith to rest in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God.
All right. Ah. Uh, see, we're in time where we're going to see that all this stuff's beginning to fail. It's important that our faith has not become dependent upon systems and networks, but it's in the power of God. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3 and 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. This people has got a form of godliness. They talk a good game. They got a form of godliness, but they deny the power. I don't want to deny the power. I want to accept the power of God. I want to walk in the power of God. Lord, I, I need you. I know what it's like to be sick for real. I know what it's like to be on my own, on my bed of sickness and affliction. I know what it's like to lie that and not one person is there but you and God. So you better learn what you really believe. I'm not talking about personal comfort. I'm talking about what you really believe. I know what it's like when, the doc, when every doctor you go see say, you look like you all right to me. I know what it's like when they sit up there and tell you, I don't know what else to do. I'm not telling you somebody else's story. I'm telling you mine. But God, I don't want my faith to rest in the wisdom of people, but in the power of God. Well, Pastor, you don't believe in going to the doctor? Yeah, I go. I got an appointment this, next month. No problem. I love going up in there. And they say, you're doing so well. Yep, God is good, ain't he? I love when we can sit there and talk about the way I used to be. Uh-huh. Oh, give God all the glory. Oh, yeah. Don't have no problem. What did Jesus say? Go show yourself to the priest. So I go show myself to the priest. Let, let, let me keep moving. Let me keep moving. First Peter. Ah. My, my, my. Well, I, I tell you what, let me, let me, let me, let me, give me a few minutes. Y'all got me excited today, so might as well finish out. Second Timothy 4 and 7. The Apostle Paul, you know the scripture, he says, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. Listen to this. It's what comes through the sifting that is of value. It's what comes through the sifting that is of value. You know all the stuff Paul said he went through. But look what he kept. Look what came through the sifting. And what did Jesus pray, pray for Peter? That your faith fell not. It's not about our feelings. It's about our faith. It's about our faith. First Peter 1 and 7. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found of the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. It was always about our faith, not about our feelings. That faith is more precious than anything else. It's our faith that will bring praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, not our feelings. Whatever the sifting is, Keep the faith. Whatever happens, whatever's going on, keep the faith. That's what's going to bring praise, honor, and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. It's not going to be that car, that house, some of those illicit relationships. It's not going to bring glory, honor, and praise at the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we need sifting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Stuff that's in our lives it needs to be sifted. Amen. Mark 16 and 7. You know, Peter says I, he's going to follow Jesus everywhere and be with him and I'll never leave you. Jesus, you could count on me. You know, he tells all of that. 
And you know, he denies Christ three times because Jesus said he would. And sure enough, he did. But listen to this. The angels are talking to the disciples and they said, but go your way. Tell his disciples. I mean, talking, I think it's Mary and them here. But go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter. Wait a minute. He didn't have to put those two words in there. He could have just said, tell his disciples. Peter wanted the disciples. But see, because you, 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 the Bible says when Peter realized he had denied Christ, he wept bitterly. It was a deep anguish in his soul because he realized well, what had happened. He realized who he really was. <clears throat> it hurt him to his core. Hurt him so bad. Can I possibly go on? Lord, I failed you. I've come up short in so many things, God. I've blown it, Lord. I've missed the mark. God, I've been away from you. I denied you. Not once, not twice, but three times. And I talked the big talk, Lord. Hurts me to my core now when I see who I really am. Hurt me so bad, I don't know if I can get up anymore, Lord. I, I mean, it's just bad. I don't know if I could ever serve you. Surely you wouldn't take me back after this. You wouldn't want nothing to do with me after being like this. So the angel said, listen, go your way. Tell the disciples and Peter. I just want you to know Jesus sent me to give you a message that includes Peter. By name. Tell Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him as he said. And listen, tell Peter I want to meet him in Galilee. I ain't threw him to the curve. I, 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 I ain't saying I don't want to have nothing to do with him no more. I ain't saying he ain't no good. That just full of hot air. No, no, no. I ain't saying all of that. Tell him, matter of fact, I want to meet him. See, I'm telling you, the sifting is happening because he loves you, not because God mad at you. So, yeah, I want to see him. Specifically mentioned Peter. This is the same Peter who denied Christ who would later stand up and preach one sermon and 3,000 people would get saved. See, let, let, let me see. I think I remember Jesus says, I'm praying that your faith fail now. So Jesus' prayer was answered. Talking about the things that are useful and valuable that come out of the sifting. Jude chapter 1. Verse 22 and 23, the Bible says, and of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. See, sifting is not the end. It leaves you with compassion to make a difference in the life of others. No, 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 no. I'm going to say it again. Sifting is not the end. It leaves you with compassion to make a difference in the life of others. Yes. See, sifting awakens a desire to rescue others with mercy and not judgment. Yes. See, right now, we can easily look at somebody and say, you are guilty. And not understand that mercy says all of us were guilty. Yes. But he forgave us because of his mercy. And now, because we've been sifted in the process, we look at others differently because if not the grace of God, there go I. See, how much of that, how much of us has become so judgmental since we've been walking with God now? Look at that heathen. Look at that unbeliever. Look at that. They, 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 they ain't number sinners. Such were all of us. All of us. No different. No different. But see, after sifting, after sifting, you know it ain't about your stuff no more. After sifting, it ain't about, it ain't about that good family you come from. After sifting, 
and about how much you got in your account. After sifting, now you can snatch them out of the fire because it's from compassion. I believe God wants to awaken an evangelistic urge in this house. Like never before. Unseen in the 15 years of this ministry. People that have, you thought you had an evangelist, but you really didn't understand. Because you needed to be sifted. You needed to be stripped of you. Well, now it's all about God. And now you see souls in a whole different light. Because now I see. I see me now. I see me as the man who wanted to know what's the truth? What is really, what's, what's the real truth? You see a church on every corner when I drive by, but what's the real truth? See, people on the outside saw all kind of different things when they saw me. But it was a soul searching for truth. Could somebody just tell me how to be saved? Can somebody just tell me how to serve God? I don't want to know your religious stuff. I want to know God. What about you? Maybe you were the young lady that didn't look like she fit in. You thought different about things. You had a different viewpoint than other people. The, the, maybe the sisters couldn't get with you always and it was just a little, something a little different about you, but you just wanted to know God. They set you up on the double dates because they felt that you must be lonely. Maybe that's what it is. Not knowing you had a desire. You just wanted to know God. For real. See, those people are out there. And they're waiting on us. But they're waiting on us with compassion. So we'll have mercy and not judgment. They're waiting. There's another you out there waiting. Waiting for somebody to tell them the gospel. Not a bunch of church stuff. The gospel. Can you really tell them who Jesus is? I, I mean, no, 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 no. See, see even we say gospel, we, we say, let me, let me tell you what we do now. Come to church. Come to church. Because we don't feel adequate enough to tell people about Jesus. If you can't tell about who saved you, how you know you? No, 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 don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that they shouldn't come to church, but this should be the place for instruction. Yes. We should learn how to live here. But you could tell them how to be saved right there. This should be the place, instruction, teaching, equipping for the work of the ministry. I know my job description, you know yours. The Bible says all of us have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Do you know yours? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Do you know yours? See, now sifting prepares you so you have compassion. Lord, I don't want to see nobody go to hell, Lord. Lord, hell is too bad. I don't want nobody to go to hell. I know they're treating me bad, Lord, but I still, whatever I need to do, Lord, Whatever I can do to show them a witness of what you're like, Jesus. Whatever you want me to do, Lord, use my mouth, use my hands, use my life. Because it's compassion now. See, that's a whole different perspective. Lord, use me to be a blessing. That sounds a little different than Lord, bless me. Use me, Lord, to be a blessing. See, sifting prepares you to be ignited like that. It gets the other garbage out of our lives. It gets the 
things that don't matter out. See, one day it's going to determine how many crowns you have. This whole life right here is going to be summed up in crowns. Rewards. It ain't going to be about, th think about this. Every dime you've ever accumulated, how much furthered the kingdom? The rest is not going to even matter. Every home we've ever had, how did we use it for the kingdom? Did we create a Christian environment there? Every car we've ever driven, how did we use it for the kingdom? See, all of these things are going to be summarized in rewards. How did we use what we had for the kingdom? Or were they, be, were they being consumed on our own lust? I'm not here to judge that. That's not my job. I can only do that with me. What are you doing with you? That's why we have to be sifted. Because this world tells us differently. It tells us he with the most toys wins. It tells us to hoard, to hold on to, to gather, to keep. Years ago, I believe it was Chuck Colson, I could be wrong. He said this. If all Christians paid their tithes, just their tithes, that the church wouldn't have any debt. I just want you to say that for a moment. If all Christians just paid their tithe, if they just gave the 10% they owe God, and if somebody won't pay God, if they'll rob God, see, I know, see, this, this, when you talk about stuff like this, people drop their head. But this is the part of the sifting. This is showing you part of you that you don't like. Amen. It's not me. It's the mirror of the word. Mm -hmm. You're seeing you in the word. You can run. You can hide or think you're running and hiding. But it's not. Holy Spirit can whoop you like nobody. Amen. He can whoop you while you're watching the game. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. You, you, <laughs> everybody think you're excited because they dunk. No, you just, oh, oh God. Y'all, but you know what? Nobody's, nobody's like God. Nobody. Nobody. He loves us with an absolute, total love. It's unconditional. He reigns on the just as well as the unjust. You could be mad at God. He still loves you. <laughs> he like, you get over it. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can. You can be mad at God. We've been mad. Yeah, we've been mad at God because it was something we didn't like, something we wanted, but he still loved us in the midst of being mad. Things that we didn't do that he told us to do, he still loved us. There's nobody like God. But I just want you to know the sifting has begun. And he loves you while you're being sifted. He loves you when you're kicking and screaming, being sifted. He loves you while you're not liking being sifted. But the sifting has begun. Your money ain't going to stop it. Let me really help you. And this is basically, I, I want to say, this is for our ladies. Your crying ain't going to help. God is not moved by tears. Not in the sense of, we, you, you, you remember when we was little, little kids and you about to get a whooping? You think you could cry real hard so you won't get the whipping. <laughs> ah! Like you, you like you don't lost your mind. They be like, I ain't even done nothing to you yet. <laughs> That's not going to stop God from giving you what you need. The sifting has begun. 
This is not just sifting in our personal life. This is sifting in the church. The Lord reminded me of something. Listen to this. God is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. Listen. In order to remove spots, there has to be agitation. You know what's in your washing machine? An agitator. So we got to remove the spots. Then he said, without spot or wrinkle. When you iron out the wrinkles, you need pressure and heat. Oh, I'm preaching better than you said. Amen. The sifting has begun. I'm finished. God bless you. Hello. Thank you for taking the opportunity to tune in with us on today. I believe it's a tremendous blessing to be able to hear and receive from the Word of God. I want to take an opportunity also to challenge you as you move further in not just hearing, but obeying the Word of God. The Bible speaks in Romans of the fact that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. However, it doesn't stop there. It also lets us know that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And then it leads us further to let us know that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. I want to give you an opportunity to meet the Savior today. An opportunity to meet Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, the one who died for our sins, who was buried, and who was raised again from the dead. Today, you can know him personally. I want you to take this opportunity to pray with me. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. Please forgive me of my sins. I know that you are the son of the living God. And I believe that you gave your life for me. Come into my life. Come into my heart. Be the Lord and Savior of my life. And I thank you now for saving me. Amen and amen. Listen, if you've prayed that prayer, you've just accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You are now part of the family of God. Your life has been changed forever. I want to encourage you now to be a part of a Bible-believing church, somewhere where you can be fed the Word of God. The Bible says man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It's important that you're hearing from God. It's important that you're growing in God's grace. I want to encourage you, find a place that you can connect with other like-minded believers and grow in the things of God. It will make all the difference in your new life as you live as unto the Lord. I also want to encourage those that may be watching now, and maybe you're already saved, maybe you're already part of a, a, a church, and you're just wanting to find somewhere where you can continue to grow in the things of God and add or supplement your faith. Thank you for taking this opportunity and allowing us to be a part of that supplement. Also, I want to say this. Some of you all may be watching and you say, well, how can I give to that ministry? How can I sow into that ministry? Well, listen, I want to encourage you to take the opportunity. We have an app that you can actually uh, download to your phone and you can give to this ministry at any time that you want to, or feel free to go to our website. You can go to our website and on our website, you will find, uh, an opportunity to donate. There's a donate button, click on that button and it will further direct you into being able to give into this ministry. Listen, I believe that giving is a gain and not a loss. Jesus says it's more blessed to give than to receive. The Bible lets us know that he increases the fruits of our righteousness. When we give, the Bible lets us know that he causes us to increase. He increases the fruits of our righteousness. It's all because God has allowed us to partake in the work that he is doing in the earth. And that is giving. That is giving of his son unto us. So when we give, we have an opportunity to imitate what God has been doing for us all along because it wasn't that we deserved it. It was that God was so good that he was giving his own son on our behalf. 
I pray that the message has been a blessing to you. And I encourage you to come out, be a part of what we're doing. We're located at 740 North Main Street here in High Point, North Carolina. Feel free to join us every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. or every Wednesday evening at 7.20 p.m. God bless you and thank you again for being with us. God bless.